of you. Um, I must thank BW to have all of us here. Uh, it indeed is a real pleasure to be here with my esteemed panelists and I would just take one minute each to introduce uh, everyone here. Mr. Pramod Dubey actually needs no introduction. He's a well-known, well-regarded face um, as a senior advocate in the Delhi High Court and Supreme Court and has actively contributed a fair bit to um, the jurisprudence when it comes to especially bail law. We have uh, Mr. Siddharth Batra here with us, who has been standing AAG for, the, uh, for advoc additional advocate general for the state of Haryana, a well-known AOR in the Supreme Court. We have uh, Samundra Sarangi here, who is a partner with law offices of uh, Panag and Babu, and uh, constantly is advising um, various companies which are on the Fortune 500 list and Nifty 500 companies on white collar crime issues. Nikhil Vashni here is a, uh, is a director with uh, Sil Amarchand Mangaldas and is also a well-known face when it comes to advisory relating to um, white collar crimes and money laundering. Um, the, in, the topic for this panel is rather interesting because it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, bail is, is, is uh, bail law actually is today in the country uh, a much talked about topic. Uh, the media covers it enough. Uh, when we go back in history to the 1950s as well, since then, Supreme Court has repeatedly held that bail is, uh, bail is the rule and jail is an exception. But the trajectory of uh, the bail jurisprudence has seen a lot of upheaval, especially since uh, the advent of white collar crime in India has been on the rise with the 2G scam and then the coal scam. For the first time when, uh, you know, despite the Delhi High Court judgment, uh, where accused in 2G scam after filing of touch sheet were taken into custody. That led to uh, the Supreme Court's judgment in Sanjay Chandra, once again reiterating the principles on bail. But since then, again, we've had a lot of upheaval, especially with the twin conditions uh, in the PMLA Act and uh, the serious fraud uh, investigating office powers. So on that note, I think I will leave it to my panel to take it from there. I will start, of course, with Mr. Dubey. Uh, so my question to you is, is the bail jurisprudence in India, especially when it comes to white collar crime cases in consonance with Article 21 rights provided for in the Indian Constitution? You are well versed with it because you are practicing in the criminal side. Uh, one thing is very important in the entire criminal jurisprudence. That is the presumption of innocence. Correct. So in, during the course of the investigation of the trial, you are not held guilty. So you being the uh, person, you have the very precious right, that is the Article 21. And if you go in the entire structure of the criminal jurisprudence, the entire structure of the criminal jurisprudence is based on Article 21. From the very beginning till the end, the accused persons are being given the right every time to prove their innocence. Like at the time of the uh, investigation, you have the right to move the application for the bail. After the filing the charge sheet, you can move the application for bail. Then the supply of the document without uh, uh, be making the payment to the, then the, it is a duty of the court to supply you. You can consult your lawyer. You, if you are not able to engage the lawyer, you the legal aid and the court will provide you the amicus query to, to assist you. Even uh, uh, at the last stage, the, every accused would uh, make the statement on oath, but the accused has been given the right to make the statement without oath after consulting the lawyer. So the entire things, if you see the chronology of the entire criminal jurisprudence, the only thing you will find Article 21. And one thing is very important, I and mean, we must understand the only test in the entire criminal jurisprudence, whenever you are fighting the case, every stage you will find 
तो डॉक्टिन ऑफ प्रिजुडिस दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इफ द स्टेट इज मूविंग इन एप्लीकेशन और द एक्यूज पर्सन डिफेंस इज मूविंग इन एप्लीकेशन द ओनली टेस्ट बिफोर द कोर्ट इज वाट प्रिजुडिस इज बींग गोइंग टू कॉस्ट and you have to meet out your case regarding the prejudice but there is no thermometer there is no measurement of your prejudice you cannot measure that this is the my prejudice is 60 cm or 90 cm or 99 cm so there is only thermometer and there only test to examine your prejudice is article 21 you cannot deprive the personal liberty of any individual without except the procedure established by law so you have to follow the procedure established by law and that's why we have indian evidence act we have the criminal law we have the special statute the moment there is a diversion from the procedure established by law the benefit would always be given to the accused not to the state it is the duty of the state to follow the procedure established by law because the entire criminal jurisprudence the concept is the right and duty if you go to the basic concept of the hafeldian scheme of the jurisprudence it is the right of the if there is the right of the accused is the duty of the state to protect the right absolutely sir agree with you so the i would say ki article 21 is the jewel of the criminal jurisprudence absolutely sir thank you for that sir my next question is to nikhil here nikhil since you are more from you know the industry specifically Uh, I wanted to ask you: Do you think that the reluctance, or the alleged reluctance in granting of bail, is dampening the entrepreneurial spirit in the country? I mean, Neha, I don't, I don't think anybody sitting in this room would deny uh, the question that you have asked. I think it's too, too, it's, it's very much known that you know the the environment in the country, at least the at least in the white collar crime space, is such that you know whenever an investor comes into India. it's not by of course a lot of focus has been on ease of doing business but this is also one of the areas that uh, an investor investor looks into that how are the courts courts going come coming to rescue just in case you know the company or they are in legal trouble that's one part of it the second part of course the second part of course is uh, we saw recently justice diva chandrachur announcing 10 bail cases every day being heard while of course the the intent was correct with respect to you know hearing the bail applications but i think what got left out is the white collar crime sector because you know of i mean at least in the while there are certain judgments which recently came in after entel came in entel 3 be it justice bambani judgment in ashish malhotra or maybe rana kapoor where in you know the court at least the delhi high court if not the other high courts have started you know giving green signal to bails be it in ed matters or be it in uh, uh p a b it in p e d matters or uh, b uh, b it in the sfio matters but yeah i mean any investor coming into india would definitely has a question if the courts in india would come to save and funnily enough the part uh, funnily enough the pro the problem is that you know when the every the business is hunky dory no one is everything is all good but once you are in a soup then you know it's it's you 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 know you you crumble like anything So that the lawyers also are remembered, no? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think to, uh, to some extent maybe the IBC also has some role to play there because it is only after the IBC came in that we saw, and of course it all started from 2011 when Sanjay Chandra came in. But we saw, you know, when and it came, it merged with uh, the enactment of IBC that you know once there is some someone going insolvent or maybe fraud circular, you know, fraud uh, 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 and a business a bank account turning fraudulent. it's all the enforcement agencies all is going to start getting active uh, about it so so that way it is so Thank you're you. actually right to say that and that in the uh, in very many cases ibc and um, you know uh, ed issues or uh, sfio issues go hand in hand one triggers the other so actually that leads me to my next question to samudra um samudra tell me how relevant or important or more appropriately put necessary is it to arrest somebody in sort of any money laundering issue or a fraudulent bank account issue triggered by the you know declaration of um, account as a fraud especially when most of these transactions go back to the hunky dory period and all of them are documented so it's not that you need any recovery to be made how relevant is an arrest in such cases yeah so i think as defense counsel dealing with white collar crime issues we have a lot to be mourn in terms of how 
jurisprudence has evolved in terms of white collar crime. But the one thing that I think the agencies have a right to bemoan even more is the task that they are faced. Correct. It's a complex job. It's, it's not, I mean, investigating somebody through and through to either identify somebody who's guilty or if actually a bribery crime has been committed. And when it comes to money laundering, the threshold's even higher, right? So given the, the significance of the task, unpopular opinion or not, I believe given how structured some of these crimes can be, arrest is probably one of the more effective ways to investigate. Now, I say this with a little bit of pinched conscience and, a little, uh, and some assumptions, of course, that if, if an agency is doing its job without any sort of influence and it's really conducting an investigation independently, subjecting yourself to arrest and walking out on the other side, uh, explaining to them your innocence is probably one of the best clean sheets you can get, even better than getting a clean sheet from court. So I feel arrest is an important tool that agencies have to exercise. The question really becomes is, is it being exercised to find the truth or, or, or what the facts are regarding an investigation? Or is it only being done to deprive liberty? I think one set of exercise of power, moral, has a, liar, has a higher ground to achieve, may, may be some tangible benefit to the investigation at large. But if it's being exercised to curtail liberty, which in some cases, more often than not, is what seems to be becoming the trend, I think that's, that's a dangerous set of jurisprudence that we're sort of walking into into the future. I, I, I'd like to follow that up, actually, with a short question to you. How do you read um, what you've just said with uh, the, the Supreme Court ju judgment in until, where the Supreme Court has categorically said that if consciously somebody is not arrested, and uh, then post-filing of charge sheet, you needn't arrest them. How do you read it in with what you're saying? That means the investigative agencies actually have the power not to arrest, also have the discretion not to arrest, yeah. especially in white-collar crime cases. Yeah, so I think one important trend to observe is there are no, there's no longer a case where there's only single charge sheet, right? Yeah. There are cases with multiple charge sheets. Correct. So cases, cases with cases with seven, ten charge sheets. Correct. The more complex ones. So there is a scenario where a charge sheet has been filed and you still need to investigate further to unearth everything else you're discovering as part of a supplementary investigation. Now again, as long as the supplementary charge sheets, the supplementary investigation is a follow-up to the initial investigation, fair enough. I think there's a merit to be had in a post-charge sheet arrest as well. But if the objective again is to come back with more dirt only to stick somebody in jail for an extended period of time, that's, that's complex history. I think investigative agencies' motivations play a large part in whether that's a fair practice or not. I, I would tend to agree with that. Siddharth, um, I'd like to ask you, tell me, in your view, is it correct to classify economic crimes as a separate category of offenses, especially when it comes to bail? Good evening. Uh, first of all, it's great to be sitting next to Mr. Dubey, I believe, uh, an authority when it comes to white collar crimes. Uh, I've had the pleasure of assisting him on a lot of matters and uh, great to be with him on this panel. And uh, thank you, Hina. I got to know you comp a lot of in-depth knowledge about this as well. Though this doesn't remain my area of practice, but uh, I've also seen, uh, since as a practicing lawyer, as to what has happened, I've had the opportunity of uh, advising a few clients on this. Obviously, so look, as far as, closer. so now, uh, lately, if you see, uh, the PMLA is what, what, we are, what we are talking about, as uh, what was mentioned about Vijay Madan Lal, the judgment. One of my fellow uh, panelists was mentioning that. Look, the PMLA is as an economic offense is associated, one with the schedule offense. It has to be a schedule offense first, which is provided in the list in the PMLA, and then comes the PMLA. This becomes a very uh, significant uh, feature because it becomes first it's an economic offense it's uh, to do with the social system that we have and it's to do with the economy of the country as well so therefore to categorize it separately i i believe uh, neha is completely valid uh, there's no problem as far as the categorization is concerned obviously uh, as you see uh, that uh, what is lately happening is that uh, bail has become a very difficult uh, uh, to get uh, in cases uh, of PMLA, uh, usually uh, the twin conditions which are coming in section 45 is a very hard uh, uh, thing to cross. And the law is completely uh, different as you were also m mentioning initially, that in fact uh, it has to be shown by the accused as to uh, how he is not guilty. And uh, if you see that the reading of the section itself, it says that the court will only grant you bail when uh, it, is, it is shown on the record that the person is not guilty of the offense. Though uh, Mr. Dubey can put more light into it, what my reading is that ultimately it's equivalent to an acquittal. It's today. It's one of my follow-up questions. And yes, uh, yeah. it, it's that severe, if you ask me. And uh, 
The second thing is that uh, uh, the question that you've uh, posed to me about the, uh, be this being an economic offense, look, it is connected to a scheduled offense as what I said. If there's an offense under the IPC or the Prevention of Corruption Act, it does not originate on its own. Whether a person can be uh, kept inside or whether a person can be prosecuted under the PML alone is a question which has been answered by Vijayan Madanlal. But if you ask me, the Enforcement Directorate is uh, interpreting it differently. And in some cases, the ED is saying that, in fact, the accused need not to be in the, in the scheduled offense if he's actually laundering the money which has come out of their, their offense. And it's single on its own can stand as well. Uh, Vijay Madanlal, yes, put some clarity on it. What we as defense counsel read it as that, look, it can't be a standout offense on its own. It has to be connected. But yeah, obviously, as far as the categorization is concerned, it's a serious offense. And uh, since it pertains to, uh, uh, that way, the economy of the country, I believe uh, the, I, I, I consider the categorization to be completely, perfectly valid. Um. So, uh, Ms. Dubey, I'd like to ask you, sir, you know, there has always been this whole debate about bail is the law, or bail is the rule and jail is the exception. But somewhere post 2011, the Sanjay Chandra judgment, Supreme Court started taking a divergent view when it came to economic offenses by broadly saying that in Vai Jagan Reddy and Neera Yadav, that economic offenses damage the social fiber in the economy of the country and hence bail ought not to be granted or should be restrained in such conditions. That coupled with what we call as the twin conditions, more particularly in the NDPS Act, PMLA, and now SFIO, which is where one, the public prosecutor has to be heard, and two, you have to give, the court has to come to a finding, which is pretty much equivalent to a, an acquittal, that there is no offense as alleged made out. So the bailing arena, if I may call it, in the country is stormy and tough. There have been divergent views, even with the twin conditions, where in 2017, Supreme Court struck down the twin conditions in Section 45 of the PMLA, Nikesh Tara Chanjain. Then Parliament, by an amendment, in the form of a clarification in August 2019, resurrected it. That came to be challenged in Vijay Mandal Lal Chaudhary. Finally, in Vijay Mandal Lal Chaudhary, in July 2022, it was upheld. Now, though of course the twin conditions when it comes to SFIO is still pending consideration, the fate of it is almost way to comply. <laughs> My question to you really, sir, is <coughs> we've also seen until happen, three such three rounds of until, until one, until two, until three, which is now also the last one made it applicable, uh, the, the principles of until, uh, as referred to earlier, uh, to anticipatory bail law. But, sir, my question is, and it's a, it's, it's a disturbing question as a, dis uh, as a defense counsel, that are these twin conditions absolutely relevant are they required? Do we need them to be on the statute book? I mean, in your view, are they not, uh, you know, if they're not applicable to the predicate offense, why have them in the offense that arises out of the predicate offense? Uh, Nia, being the part of the judicial system, we have the judgment in the Madan Bijalal Chaudhary. Yes. And the Bijalal, Madan Lal Bijalal Chaudhary has already given the finding that twin condition is constitutional, not the unconstitutional. The, you have rightly mentioned that the Nikish Tara Chand, it has already been declared by the Supreme Court that twin condition is unconstitutional. But the, see the beauty of this Madan Lal Chaudhary's judgment. Even after Madan Lal Chaudhary's judgment, Justice Rivington, who was the author in the Nikish Tara Chand, has openly made the statement at the public forum that this judgment, Vijay Lal Chaudhary's judgment, is not in consonance with the personal liberty and the constitutional mandate of the country. So even there is a, so many views are there. See, ultimately the question is bail. What is bail? Bail is for the limited purpose to ensure the person's presence to face the trial. You cannot put the stringent condition by putting the draconian law depriving the person. You cannot judge the person whether he and how the accused, this is also debatable, how the accused will prove his innocence at the stage of the investigation when the entire materials are lying with the prosecuting agency. And the, how the court will give the finding he is uh, not guilty and he will not commit any offense in the future. So this, this concept of the twin condition is completely stranger to the concept of the personal liberty. But we don't have any option. The Supreme Court has already given the finding. But the beauty, 
we are very lucky we are practicing in the high court and we have the judgment of justice vk zain of delhi high court in rana kapoor ki if the person has not been arrested and the complaint has been filed at least we have the one set of the judgment which says ki no there is no need to put the person behind the bar the question we have put the y jagan reddy case uh, yes there was a jury said that time ki the economic offenses and it should be seriously be taken and it is damaging the social fabrics and everything but we are again very fortunate we have got the jurisprudence by justice sanjay kishan call in a satender kumar until and he has clarified ki even the offenses are of economic offenses this cannot be the sole ground to reject the bail you have to see the entire material you have to take the holistic view you have to consider the bail jurisprudence so as on date because satender kumar until he started with the two judges ultimately it went to the three judges so at least we have the judgment of the three judges which says ki no why why jagan reddy case is not the sole test for the economic offenses and the judges have the discretion to grant the bail and i think i am the since i practicing in the defense side so most of time i have taken the opportunity to defend the right of the accused and follow the personal liberty so in my view there is no purpose for the continuation of the twin condition and put the person behind the bar as a pre trial convict they are not the pre the convict they are the pre trial prisoner and that time unless and until you release the person how the person will create the defense how will assist the system so you are depriving the person by putting this in a stringent condition only under the garb of only under the garb of the so called commission of the offense of the pmla sfio though there is no twin condition in the schedule of offenses so they are bail on the schedule of offenses but you are putting per, be, person behind the bar for the money laundering and uh, still till the court has to come to the conclusion whether the, there is a commission of the offense or not but you want to test everything at the stage of the bail so i don't think that putting the twin condition is in this spirit of the protection of the personal liberty of a human being thank you sir i think that's a great deal of insight into uh, the position of law so mr my next question is to you in your view uh since you since you are a defense counsel uh, like most of us here in your view does delving into allegations and requiring the court to come to findings on the alleged role of the of, uh, of the accused in the offense does it result in conducting a mini trial at the stage of bail mm, the, there's a short answer to that yes it does <laughs> there's uh, there's a lot of jurisprudence now that we keep saying that you know you shouldn't have mini trial at the stage Correct. of bail but i think that's more paperwork as opposed to what we see in trial courts Correct. and what we have to fight in in the high court i know it was a rhetorical question to ask you Fair, but but this this is how i look at it though i think uh, i echo what, uh, what mr dubey said wholeheartedly right and at a principle level i i i don't have to say much more about what i feel about the twin conditions after what mr dubey said so that's taken care of but since the supreme court sort of closed the door on what twin conditions may look like in the future it's pretty much going to be this as defense counsel our role has changed i think we can no longer rely on the standard tests of bail that we have been historically lying uh, relying upon for the last couple of decades the tri yeah, test the a triple test a triple yeah. test is, is no longer i mean uh, we can I, i think everybody here has defended somebody where we file judgment compilations with until 1 yeah. 2 3 and all the judgments yeah. that are, but other than other than adding to the wealth of paperwork to the for the court's disposal they don't seem to yeah. move the needle on bail so what i feel we really need to do is change what our, our approach to dealing with money laundering cases especially i think we have to be open that we have to fight an ecir like it was a charge sheet and then when we get a charge sheet you fight the charge sheet like your life depended on it like you were fighting a conviction correct that's the only way to get bail i, I feel it's a very interesting prerogative actually it's, perspective it's, i think we are last i think we are we are past the stage where we can fight the twin conditions i think that fight was fought and that's been lost so i think we have a moral duty now to fight the twin conditions for what it is and an ethical duty to our clients to fire away and around it correct uh i i i take this to nikhil nikhil very correctly you mentioned um, the ashish mittal judgment which recently by the delhi high court justice bambani said that you know you even at the stage of bail you don't you need to prima facie come to uh, a finding so basically he's kind of you know 
blown off the steam to some extent. But despite that, I'll ask you, do you think twin conditions actually prejudice the accused of a defense? Because even prior to you know, arguing charges, you are going down arguing your entire case. Uh, do you think that causes a fair bit of prejudice? That indeed does. I mean, uh, no two doubts about it. That you know, the, the twin condition basically is more like a test other than the regular conditions that are there for a bail. You have to undergo the test of the twin conditions, uh, which are Literally there, and, five, and five which again, as uh, Dubey sir had put it, that you know, it's more like you know you are undergoing a mini trial, and as you also just said it, that you are undergoing a mini trial at the time of bail, be it uh, for the regular bail or whichever, whatever the case is. But having said so, I would also like to say, I mean, you know, again, hats off to the Delhi High Court and hats off to Justice Bambani, that when in at least in Ashish Malhotra he says that don't see these two conditions. These are actually, these are only the conditions that have to be, you know, uh, the test that has to be passed through. But don't see them as, you know, as anything which is bending against the accused. Uh, and, you know, uh, whatever evidence you may have, whatever evidence you may have, however good uh, the prosecution case may be, at the end of the day, it has to pass through the test of, uh, you know, the trial. Okay. So that way it is. Uh, that's how I, t I see it. Thank you for that. And before we, I think we're running out of a lot of time and I have my closing comments also. So Siddharth, I'll quickly ask you this. So, the, you know, there is an exception to the twin conditions, which is basically it's not applicable to the sick and infirm, to women. Uh, being the only woman on the panel here, I should not be saying that. <laughs> but, you know, to women and to anybody who's under the age of 16. So in your view, are such exceptions required or do they create prejudice? I think uh, we all will agree here on this uh, dice that that's the silver lining. Uh, since being the twin conditions as discussed by the earlier panelists, it's uh, so hard to get the bail. So that's the only silver lining that we have that in, in fact on medical conditions and all that uh, bail is managed and uh, courts are granting bails. But as far as uh, your question is concerned that as to whether uh, look these ex exceptions are in the right spirit or not, obviously yes, I feel uh, women uh, have special needs and ultimately, uh, in my, my personal opinion that in some cases, women are the directors, but it's the men who are running the business. And uh, there, if there are uh, some cases of the PMLA and with such uh, uh, stringent conditions that they have, it may not be the right proper thing uh, to, to uh, put the woman behind the bars. And, uh, and the incarceration is also long. We are seeing that uh, usually in cases of PMLA, uh, it's very hard to get uh, bail, uh, not before the, uh, fi final complaint has filed, but uh, even after that, it's, it's very difficult to get the bail. And number two, regarding minors uh, uh, who are less uh, than the age of 16, obviously uh, we already have a law. Yeah. Uh, they are considered to be juveniles, juveniles, and uh, there is a reformative theory that uh, our uh, jurisprudence follows. So on that, I believe it's in the right context. And uh, other disabled, and I think uh, the care has been taken because ultimately, uh, it's a fraud which has been which has been played upon in the PMLA, where some money has been laundered, and where uh, so some some people with special needs uh, may not face the incarceration. So exceptions have been drawn, I think, rightly drawn, and uh, I think a lot of us are uh, now trying to uh, manage uh, for our clients if they can get out on uh, some medical. medical grounds. Yeah, thank you for that, Siddharth, and I'll finally take it to the closing comments. What I have personally noticed as a practitioner of, uh, on the white collar crime side is that multiple bail petitions uh, sort of end up clogging the courts. So trials don't really end up starting. Uh, and then there is this whole hue and cry of pendency in of uh, criminal trials or trials generally. And, but read that in with this unnecessary load that comes in with bail applications. And because there are multiple accused now, multiple bail applications. So um, Mr. Dubey, I'd like your views on that. See, Niha, my first concept in the criminal law is bail must be granted. There is no purpose keeping the person behind me. And one interesting thing I would like to mention, you have mentioned regarding the exception regarding the woman, I would like to say, you won't find since the enactment of PMLA Act till date, any female, any woman has fled from the justice who are facing the offenses of PMLA or the SFIU. So one thing, so second... law abiding by nature. So yeah, that's a law abiding by nature. So they have, <laughs> not, they have not misused the personal liberty granted to them. And the courts should see, we, one side we are crying every forum or 
judicial officers, the chief justice, everyone has the concern of the pendency of the matters. What we are doing, we are multiplying the pendency by denying the person behind the bar. Every time they are after a month, after two months, the first bail application, second bail application, third bail application. Because the person is not willing to stay in the jail. They have the right, they are the human being. You cannot put behind the bar on the assumption and presumption of your investigating officer. So the, at least you should be liberal. And I am also again saying that we are very grateful to the jurisprudence led by Justice Sanjay Kishan Call in Sanjay Satinder Kumar Antil. And the Satinder Kumar Antil has opened the path. And not only that, in Satinder Kumar, until there was a defiance of the order passed by the Supreme Court, and the Justice Sanjay Kishan called passed the direction to send the judicial officer for the training. So this is this kind of the proactive approach should be taken by the higher judicial officer so that the lower judicial officer should be encouraged to grant the bail. Yes. Unfortunately, what is happening if you are getting the bail from the lower judiciary? or the trial court, there is a presumption that no, there is no application of why the bail was granted immediately. You see, let us what happened in the Priti Chandra's matter. It's unfortunate, sir. It's unfortunate. She got the bail after being behind bar for more than two years and it then they immediately a stay of the bail. Correct. So this kind of the thing will increase the volume yes. of the matters in the Supreme Court and the High Court and any matters and there would be, so there is a, 100% certainty I, I for like the multiplying the pendency of the matter you cannot do. So on that note, I'd like to interrupt because you have a positive time and ask Samudra and uh, Nikhil and Siddharth for their short closing comments, please. Um, to close, I'd say that the, the, the rules of the game have changed and I think we need to change with it. Uh, to borrow from one of uh, in India's historical oppressors, if the ED or the agencies fight in the sun, then we fight in the shade. If they fight in the rain, we fight in the, in the dry. But the question is the fight's on. But one thing I'd like to borrow is lower courts do need to come in. Lower, needs, lower courts need, do need to start granting bail a little more. That kind of jurisprudence has to flow down from top down. Correct. And uh, that's, and that's when we'll see historical our, change. Our Chief Justice has been very clear about that in and recent And I hope times. that continues. Absolutely. Nikhil, I'd like your views. So I would say that we have, up, until now, we have seen until three. Now let there be until 4 and until 5 possibly because of course the Supreme Court is you know monitoring all of the entire case and more and now until 4 should be like this that you know let there be consolidation of bail applications when you know, an investigation is happening when two three different enforcement agencies are you know investigating one particular transaction or one particular accused so let there be consolidation let one certain particular judge hear the matter dispose of all the bail all the bail applications arising out of different enforcement agencies in one go in e in, the, in the event it is so happening that the second that the second bail is to be filed because only the investigation are, are, uh, are investigation uh, came into picture only when the uh, bail was granted in the first matter this investigation by ED, for example, begin only subsequently, then in that case, the first order of bail should act as an aid, uh, as a protective order for me, so that I don't go running Correct. behind, you know, taking that, uh, again, anticipatory bail or something. I agree with you. Like and on that note, I take Thank it to Siddharth for his closing comments. Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, I think I can feel the pain of the, all the lawyers and the dice that uh, bail has been very, very difficult, I think. The law needs a relook uh, as far as twin conditions are concerned. And uh, you talked about uh, Neha rightly about the pendency of the case and time it's taking. Look, uh, what the investigating agencies are doing is they're coming up with a plethora of documents in order to uh, completely implicate somebody uh, in, in an offense, and you're not even getting the bail. It's, I know it's uh, completely taking a lot of time. I echo what. Uh, uh, Mr. Dubey said about what Justin Rohinton uh, later on made a comment on a public forum about the judgment. I think I completely agree that uh, this uh, needs a complete relook, and uh, the lower judiciary needs to be sanitized as well. And that their orders, when they grant bails to in such cases, should not be looked upon with such kind of suspicion. And it's not just the superior courts uh, which have the right to grant bail. I think uh, okay. the our lower courts should have those powers. They already have the powers, but they should not be looked with any thank kind of suspicion. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Siddharth, for that. Uh, I'd obviously like to thank my esteemed panel for their views. It's been a very thought-provoking session. It's been an absolute... And one thing, you'll give the credit to all the panelists. We are uh, uh, very disciplined panelists. We have basically <laughs> made up that so time. I've absolutely enjoyed <laughs> so my... 
so credit goes to the mo- uh, the jury chair and the <laughs> moderator no, sir it, it's so much of a diversity i'm the only woman here i have thoroughly enjoyed moderating this panel or should i say manning this panel but on that note thank you once again and i may open the question of the house for some questions i have a question for mr dubey uh, uh, you talked about uh, uh, bail is a must right uh, we also talked about Uh, the situations where trial court doesn't grant the bail. Uh, what happens when the FIR is quashed? What happens when the accused is discharged after the filing of the charge? Why is that jurisprudence not developing where the state is compulsorily made to compensate for the wrong uh, jail? The, the accused has been put into the jail. Uh, why is the police officers or the investigators not penalized because they have made a wrong arrest and we all know two things for sure which is which is a matter of something which is in public domain many a times these arrests are motivated many a times the firs are filed which are motivated firs so what is why is that not happening so tell us something about that um uh, thank you mr sundram uh, i would like to say ki we our society are not proactive there is a provision for the malicious prosecution if you go in the crpc there is a provision i think 188 or 182 crpc uh, ipc which give the uh, is, there is a provision ki if somebody has done the malicious prosecution you can file the case even there is a provision you can file the suit for the declaration and the compensation but the people are so apprehensive they don't want to come forward and the file the case against the state agency because they have always they are always carrying the apprehension they would be implicated in some other case so everyone enjoys the peaceful life and they are basically forgetting what has happened we are not in that country where we are so proactive we are so this rise so apprehensive with the state machinery that's why we are n- sleeping over our right but we have the provision no but i am on the point that why is the court not making it a part of the order why to which they are quashing the fi see there are two th- things the quashing one is the, the ingredients of the cases are not made out second thing the factual aspect third thing if there is acquittal ultimately there is a acquittal acquittal the prosecution failed to prove this case beyond the reasonable doubt and there is a one finding that is there is no material at all so it totally depend upon the finding of the court if there is no material at all then you have the right you have the right to prosecute the person who has filed initiated the malicious prosecution but if there is your acquittal is based your quashing petition is based on the technical ground of course you are not liable to be compensated so there are so many things in the criminal jurisprudence to get the fir quest if you apply bhajan lal test then this is all together and this is also the one of the ground for the bhajan lal is the malicious prosecution then it is the liable to be quest so we have the provision but the only the thing is the people are not coming forward they are not utilizing their right so it is not like that ki there is no provision and the why the court should be so proactive because we have the uh, three layer three tier judicial system if the suppose the trial court has given the finding you never know what would be the finding in the high court and the litigants the accused persons have always apprehension if they are going to file the case for the compensation the state will fight tooth and nail to get the order set aside then they will go behind the bar so nobody is trying to and willing to fight with the state machinery this is the reason i'll just close one one added thought i mean to leave uh just to close on a slightly unsettling note as an agency the ed has a staggering stat of its conviction rate being in less than single digits yeah. uh, i lost like single say. digits yeah roughly single digits so and it bail becomes a, a norm now probably a year year and a half so just to put things in context there'll be a whole host of people who are right now in custody who may end up never being convicted but spending a couple of years in custody while as pre trial that's custody. what happened in the 2g matter in the cold block matter where all these this whole things gathered steam it's very unfortunate but you and you're absolutely right to, to to just confirm the numbers we have the largest assets in terms of numbers 150000 crores which are attached by ed and 
1% conviction out of in the, in the 5,500 cases so far, so far filed, which is actually disturbing.